Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Cheryl Jennison DeProza, and today I'm joined by my colleague, Troy Jensen. And Troy's going to talk us through some considerations to take when designing a conference room. Uh, but before we get into that, just a few items of housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded and will be available anywhere from about one to two weeks after today's broadcast. To find this webinar and all of our past webinars, you can go to sure.com slash training. Um, we've done a lot of different webinars across a lot of different topics, um, so please feel free to go there, peruse all of our past webinars, and as I said, this one will be available at that location in about one to two weeks, sure.com slash training. Second of all, as we go through the session today, if you have any questions, please feel free to type those into the question pane. Um, we will get to questions at the end of the session, so type in your questions and be patient. Um, if you cannot see the question pane, look for a little dark gray toolbar, probably somewhere in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Um, and on that toolbar, you'll see an orange box with a white arrow. Click on that, and that will maximize your control panel and give you access to the question pane. So type in those questions, and we will answer them at the end of the session. So that wraps up all the housekeeping. Let's get into the good stuff. Take it away, Troy. All righty, good morning, everybody. So today we're gonna to be going over some basics with respect to conference room design, and we're gonna be talking about not only the technology that goes into the room, but the room itself, and, and the room is often overlooked. So communication is a fundamental part of the human experience, and we do it continuously throughout the day. Uh, communication helps shape the way we think about things, ideas, people, and going all the way back to the days when cave dwellers used burnt sticks and red clay, often to help exchange those ideas, we used graphics, um, and certainly then we progressed onto the chalkboard and the whiteboard, um, but we're using these concepts to share ideas, uh, both verbally and with graphics. So today's conference space is attempt to make this a more fluid and dynamic experience. Now, we've certainly progressed over the years. Uh, I think as far as modern conferencing is concerned, I think we can point back to the telephone being the first thing that allowed us to do communication amongst uh, several people. And over the years, that certainly developed to include video, uh, and not only video of people on the far end, but also content uh, and the ability to share content, which is more likely the most important part uh, of the uh, video conference experience. Clients' expectations uh, have increased significantly. Um, they're viewing uh, things at 4K at home. Um, they're used to very high production values in the entertainment and the content that they're receiving, uh, both from broadcasters and streaming services. So those expectations certainly carry over to uh, the video and audio conference experience. And our spaces that we've been working in have changed over the years. Um, they certainly go from the very simple at the bottom end of our triangle here up to what people call telepresence. Uh, we're certainly seeing fewer of those dedicated telepresence rooms these days, uh, but telepresence being the tip of the pyramid and probably uh, the most in, uh, the highest end experience uh, that you can have with video conferencing. And then we have a very large sector in the middle, uh, which we would refer to as medium and large conference spaces. And for all of these, there is a very large group of manufacturers uh, who are providing products uh, for this market. And it ranges everything from, you know, just a display on the wall with an HDMI cable, and again, all the way up to the telepresence rooms that uh, some of the, the larger manufacturers provide. Um, now, rooms tend to be more casual and collaborative these days, less formal. Sure is definitely in the middle there. Um, we've been providing microphones, and now we're certainly moving more and more into uh, certainly DSP and providing more and more services or products uh, to realize these audio and video conferences. It wasn't that long ago that a room like this was considered uh, at least standard, if not uh, towards the high end, with a nice four by three screen and a CRT with a VHS deck built into it on a mobile cart. Uh, and obviously we've progressed further along than that these days to a much more collaborative space with mics on the table, control system, 
flat panel display, mics in the ceiling in some instances, wireless microphones. Um, but we are also seeing a trend more towards the casual conference space, um, which is very different than the more traditional conference space that we've seen. Uh, and here we see almost like uh, the cave dwellers in the past, people writing on the walls, uh, split screens, side-by-side -side screens, uh, a more casual environment, uh, if not a couch, perhaps even something like bean bags in the room. And these environments provide challenges to the designer trying to bring technology uh, into the spaces. And in many instances, they provide challenges uh, to the environment itself, uh, the room, the acoustics. And the main thing we're looking at here is designing these spaces for intelligibility. So regardless of room size, uh, intelligibility is the critical factor when conducting a conference. Um, if we don't have the audio part of it, most of this just becomes fancy surveillance. Um, a well-designed room provides the ideal environment and set of tools to provide intelligible speech for meetings. Uh, in many conferences, spaces technology has been relied upon to improve the overall quality and intelligibility of the call. While there are often best practices in place for the selection and implementation of the equipment, uh, it is the room itself that's often ignored uh, and can provide uh, a lot of uh, challenges uh, to a properly designed and, and uh, integrated space. So this presentation, we're going to cover what elements of the room can provide a challenge. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some solutions to help alleviate some of the acoustical phenomena that you might experience. Uh, and then we're going to offer some best practice suggestions for both the room and the technology uh, when designing the space and selecting uh, what materials may be of benefit. So a properly designed room provides the best possible environment to ensure that you obtain the maximum value from the system you've installed. So what is a challenging environment? Certainly room acoustics, background noise we're going to talk about. Um, how can we overcome those challenges with acoustical treatment, proper room design? Coordination with other trades uh, is very important as well. Uh, certainly the architect, uh, other engineers who might be involved in design of the space. And last but not least, uh, a topic we're maybe more familiar with is the technology. Uh, how do we implement it? And what are some of the side effects uh, when we uh, implement some of the technology to alleviate things such as uh, background noise and things like that? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the signal chain processing, acoustic echo cancellation, and noise reduction. Uh, first, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what makes a good room. Uh, what should our uh, sites be set on with respect to what makes a good room? Room acoustics. Uh, the impulse response is essentially the acoustical signature of the room. Um, sound in a room is a combination of the direct sound, which is indicated by uh, the red line, the red arrow uh, in this graphic. And then we have a series of what we would call first, second, and third order reflections uh, within the space. And as you can see by the little inset, uh, there's uh, the energy of the direct sound, and then we have several different reflected uh, specular reflections coming in at different time arrivals because they take a longer path length to get either to the ear or the microphone. Um, so now, typically, this is done with either, well, certainly in this particular graphic is a, is a starter pistol. I may not recommend you doing that or bringing that into work, but um, a sharp, dis decisive stimulus uh, signal, a hand clap, a balloon pop, or uh, another computer-based measurement uh, tool uh, would be able to provide you with this impulse response. And what we get when we look at that is, is this graph right here. Um, and once we have this, this is a pure impulse response of the room. Uh, again, that, that fingerprint, uh, if you will, uh, of that space. And once we have that, we can apply a little bit of math and, and a process known as convolution, and we can examine the data in a different perspective. Uh, and one such graph is the energy time curve or the log squared curve. And what we can see from this particular graphic is we see the arrival of the direct sound. 
and then we have a lot of stuff that comes in after it. And if we look at this graph, we can look at this graph and everything that we know that makes a good room versus a poor room can be observed in this graph. And one of the most important things is we look at the thing that's called out as the discrete reflection. And this would be something, uh, this would be one of those first, second, or third order reflections that would be a reflection off of a hard surface, drywall, glass, for example. If we have a lot of these discrete reflections, they interfere with the intelligibility of the direct sound. Um, now, a lot of people like to point to the reverberant decay uh, or the decay of the room. I hesitate to use the word reverberant. But then again, at some point, this decays and then it hits the noise floor in the room. But what we're looking for in a good intelligible audio conference is we're looking for the arrival of that direct sound and then very little uh, discrete reflections and a relatively short dec decay slope uh, in, in this particular graph. So I would refer to that as the direct to ambient ratio, if you will. We want as much of the direct sound as possible and then as little uh, of the additional sound coming in in a relatively uh, quick or short decay slope. I hear the word reverberant a lot when we're talking about uh, small conference rooms. Um, and it's, it's a, it's a, the fact is that most conference spaces are actually too small to have a reverberant field. Uh, they do have a decay signature, as we saw from the previous graph, uh, but more importantly, it's about the reflective surfaces, uh, the drywall, the glass, uh, that provide those discrete reflections which can interfere with the direct sound. Um, which is more problematic, reverberant versus ambient? Well, they're both a concern, and we're gonna see how they interact with each other. Um, interior treatment, or the lack thereof, is usually uh, the culprit. Um, and for the most part, we're seeing new designs these days, and we're seeing glass, glass, and more glass, and I'm not sure if this is a conference room or Hannibal Lecter's next cell, but it, it's very sterile, very reflective wall surfaces, and more than likely uh, not a good room acoustically uh, in terms of use for uh, conferencing, whether that be audio or video conferencing. Um, obviously, we can use absorptive panels, wall systems, uh, there's alternate materials that we can use for absorptive material. We're going to talk a little bit more, certainly acoustical tile, carpeting, chairs and furniture are, con are concerns, and um, and we'll look at each of those when we start looking at some solutions for the rooms. So why is uh, background noise uh, an issue? Well, we're looking at what those uh, background noise sources are, and it's certainly HVAC equipment, AV equipment in the room, the projector is usually a, a good source of, of background noise in the space. We can also be getting outside noise from either uh, an external room uh, or an outside street noise, cars, sirens. Um, there's certainly uh, ambient sound coming from all of those sources. But if we look at the graph here with the person talking seated at the chair, we we look at that nice little curve that's on there and it looks very much like the energy time curve that we were just looking at. And at some point that direct sound has that decay slope. The point at which where that decay slope meets the background noise level is called critical distance. And this is a point at which the direct sound and the background sound are equal in energy level. And that critical distance is going to be a very important topic when we start talking about microphones. So I'd ask you to keep that uh, in the back. And again, this graph illustrates how important we want as much direct sound energy as possible and minimize the background noise. So we're sending a very clear signal uh, to the far end. Noise can be measured. Um, there are several criteria used in measuring background noise. Um, the most common of which is something called noise criteria. Uh, there's a series of curves, noise criteria curves, uh, which helps you rate the space, rate the noise uh, of that particular uh, space. Um, so noise criteria uh, is defined by the lowest curve that's not exceeded by the measured spectrum. So if you are measuring the noise octave band uh, on a device and plotting it, 
you would plot those data points at 63, 125, 250. And as long as you don't exceed that curve, that's the, the, or the data point that does not exceed the curve is where uh, the NC rating is for that particular space. If you go over, you have to go up to the next highest increment of five. So you can have an NC rating of 43, for example. It would either be 40 or 45, depending upon where that data point was above or below uh, those established curves. The culprit for background noise is typically HVAC, he heating, venting, air conditioning systems. Um, they have uh, a couple of components to them. Uh, ideally, you're going to have this analyzed by your mechanical engineer or if you have an acoustical consultant on board. But just so that you're aware, there are really two types of noise created by HVAC systems. And one is the low frequency component. This is the mechanical component of um, the background noise created by HVAC. Now, there are some solutions to this, uh, provided that the noise is not too intrusive. We can certainly use equalization. Uh, there's typically noise reduction on your DSP. Uh, we can reduce the number of open mics. But ideally, you would try to minimize uh, this background noise for some reasons we're going to be mentioning uh, in an upcoming slide. Uh, the high frequency component usually is about airspeed. Um, obviously, larger ductwork at slower speeds is going to be better for uh, the background noise issue. The problem with larger ductwork, it's more expensive. So mechanical engineers uh, who are on a budget typically have smaller size ductwork and they're forcing more air uh, to get that air exchange that they need to keep the room either warm or cool. So this creates turbulence, and as such, it's more of a high frequency sound background noise. Certainly EQ again can be used, um, noise reduction on the DSP, uh, or uh, some highly directional microphones, which we'll talk a little bit when we get back into critical distance and the use of microphones. Sound transmission class is the method or a testing method by which we rate uh, a partition or a barrier, if you will. Um, and that is uh, follows a rating system whereby noise is on one side of that partition uh, and we do a measurement on the other. And that partition door, window, or floor, or ceiling assembly uh, gets a rating. Uh, and that rating uh, is uh, used to, to determine how much isolation you need from a noise source. Now, I, I think it goes without saying that if you can select a room that is away from a noise source, i.e. a conference room should not next, be next to a room that has mechanical equipment, it should not be next to the cafeteria where there may be uh, louder than normal uh, noises. Um, so placement is key, at least the first step in determining where the conference room should be rated, uh, located. And if not, then you have uh, partitions, barriers, doors, and windows, all of which that have a, can have uh, an STC rating to help alleviate uh, some of that noise from getting into your space. And again, this includes walls, ceilings, floors, windows, and doors. Uh, and the density of the material that you're going to use uh, is going to help uh, in limiting the outside, the extraneous noise uh, from getting into the space. So how do we improve room acoustics? Uh, we've indicated a few things, certainly proper room isolation, the interior finish and treatment of the space. Uh, we want to reduce ambient noise. And last but not least, uh, we would deploy some of the digital the processes that are in digital signal processors. Uh, the devices that are in digital signal processors to help with some of the noise issues, but they come at a cost, and we'll talk a little bit about what those are. So proper isolation, again, we want to have high, high STC walls. Uh, it's not just the walls. Uh, the doors and windows are certainly part of it. Uh, I was at least at one commissioning where n no, we were about Outside of the window of the conference room, about 10 feet away, was all the mechanical equipment uh, for that particular building. And I couldn't help but think that if we had gone back to the design phase, maybe there would have been a better location for that particular room. 
So uh, if you can select a, a location that is away from noise producing elements, the better. Uh, if not, you're going to have to increase budget, construction budget to uh, ensure that you have higher ST rate C ratings uh, for all of the building partitions, doors and windows. Uh, just conceptually, an airtight room, a uh, room that holds water, if you will, uh, is going to be uh, a good room that's going to either prohibit sound from coming in or sound leaving uh, the space. Interior treatment um, is certainly a, a consideration. Um, now, a lot of times, architects and designers, they look at absorptive treatment and they see it as a hindrance to the overall aesthetic of the space. Um, ideally, uh, there's a lot of different systems out there now. And um, if you put enough of these options in front of them, hopefully they find some creative aspect in the material that you're trying to deploy uh, in the room. Uh, there are so many types of treatment now. Uh, there should be, some of them should provide some creative opportunity for the designer. And they include panels, uh, uh, wall systems, ceiling systems, carpet, uh, spray-on material, um, curtains, felt. This particular ceiling in this uh, picture is felt, uh, cut uh, to form a, a folk ceiling, if you will, and can be quite a decorative element. And of course, panels can be something other than a two by four. Uh, two foot by four foot panel just put on the wall to provide some decorative element uh, within the space and provide the much needed absorptive treatment that we need. HVAC, uh, ideally this would be reviewed with a mechanical engineer, whether it's new construction or even old construction. You can always have a mechanical engineer try to look at the HVAC and figure out can air speeds be lowered to minimize the noise. Certainly uh, AV equipment, if you're an integrator and user, uh, is within your control. Uh, you could put them into an enclosure or ideally maybe not have them in the room at all. Uh, selecting equipment that does not require fans. Uh, limiting computer equipment that's actually housed within the space um, is a good idea. Um, that might be a little bit difficult to do with training rooms where uh, the equipment itself is uh, part of the training exercise. Um, establish a minimum NC. Um, this is key. So typically uh, we would be looking at ideally an NC rating of a room somewhere between NC 25 and NC 30. Um, your mileage may vary and certainly as we lower the NC value of the space the cost to achieve that goes up. So it's a little bit of a compromise. Um, I would say that a room starts to become problematic somewhere around NC45, NC50 uh, with respect to background noise. And don't forget, uh, our own ears can train ourselves to kind of ignore that when we're in the room. But when that noise is picked up by a microphone and sent out to the far end, it becomes extremely distracting uh, to those trying to listen to the spoken word. Now, we typically do have noise reduction in DSP, but again, as mentioned, that does come with a cost. Um, and we'll be taking a look at what some of these effects have with the technology. So the other half of the room is the technology portion, uh, and we're going to see what technology works uh, and how technology can work along with room acoustics to help us achieve clear, intelligible audio uh, in the space. First off is the microphone. So the microphone is definitely one of the tools in your technological palette that can be used to improve the intelligibility of your conference. Both frequency response and the directionality of the microphone uh, can aid or detract from the clarity of speech. So we're not just concerned with the frequency response, uh, but we're also concerned uh, with the directionality of the microphone. And, and why are we concerned with the directionality of the microphone? Well. If we look at this graph, uh, we see those two words again, critical distance, and we see a person talking in the room, the decay of the direct sound, and eventually the decay of that direct sound falls into the ambient sound, the background sound uh, of the space. If we look at the polar pattern or the directionality of uh, different microphones, we look at an omnidirectional, a cardioid, supercardioid, hypercardioid, shotgun microphone, and an array, uh, 
we can see that there's a distance factor associated with each of those. And what that distance factor is telling us that if I'm happy with an, the sound uh, of an omnidirectional microphone in the room, let's say uh, one foot away from uh, the talker, if I go to a, a, a shotgun microphone, I'd be happy if that microphone were three feet away from the talker. If I go to an array, then I'd be happy with that array four feet away uh, from the talker. Um, now, in in the case of microphones, we're typically not able to put the microphone one foot away from somebody unless they're wearing headsets, which is not practical in a conference situation. So if we just say that the omnidirectional sounds good at 10 feet away, well, then the array would sound good 40 feet away. Uh, and it's really the only way that uh, you know, to, to overcome some of this critical distance issues. Uh, it's it's going to be either move the mic closer to the person or find a microphone that is more directional uh, is key. Pain structure uh, is certainly something to be conscious of uh, when we're looking uh, uh, at adjusting these systems. So maintaining appropriate gain structure is essential to creating good sounding audio system. Poor gain structure can lead to several problems. Not enough input gain leads to poor performance of EQ, noise reduction, your AEC, part of your DSP. If there's too much gain at some stage uh, in the uh, system, then that can often lead to distortion. You're overdriving an input. So uh, gain uh, structure is, is key. And gain must be considered uh, at every piece of equipment or through the processing in the, in the signal chain. Um, and ideally, it's a little different adjusting gain in a conferencing system than it is for sound reinforcement or public address. Um, a lot of times, the best way to do this, uh, as opposed to prescribing to something like unity gain, is to uh, listen at the far end, and that far end can either be an adjacent room or, frankly, it could be a room on the other side of the world, um, and you want to lower the gain feeding the codec and then gradually increase the gain feeding the codec until you don't hear uh, any increase in gain, or perhaps you might hear distortion, at which point you need to back it off. Um, that's probably the best way of ensuring that you're maximizing your gain uh, at every step through the conferencing process while not overdriving uh, the next piece of equipment in the signal chain. Equalization um, is also a tool to be used to improve intelligibility. Um, it can either be additive or subtractive. Um, mostly in conferencing, that EQ that's required is subtractive. Uh, we talked a little bit about the HVAC noise, uh, particularly whether it's low frequency or high frequency. So low shelf or high shelf or low cut, high pass, high frequency cut, low pass, uh, and certainly parametrics. Uh, if there is a noise or a tone, uh, a radi radiator whistle in a room uh, that can be uh, minimized by the use of a, uh, of a band pass, S filter, parametric filter, um, it, it's in your best interest, obviously, to deploy that EQ. Uh, HVAC noise is a little bit harder to, to, to eliminate with EQ. I mean, certainly if there are pure tones or you're doing a, a low cut or a high cut type of thing, um, but HVAC tends to be uh, broadband. Now, certainly if there's a, a very distinct low frequency component to that HVAC noise, you can use EQ, but if it's a little bit more broadband, uh, we may have to wait and deploy uh, something like noise reduction in our DSP. And as mentioned, other interfering steady state noise can be uh, eliminated or minimized, mitigated with equalization. On to acoustic echo cancellation. Now, <clears throat> acoustic echo cancellation is really a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, the truth that it's it is really electronic echo cancellation. Uh, acoustic echo cancellation eliminates the audio feed from the far end from being regenerated through the near-end microphones and then back to the far end, essentially eliminating a feedback loop uh, back to the far end. Uh, in order to accomplish this, you, you have to pick a reference, and 
That reference is typically what's being fed to the speakers. Uh, that reference has to be fed to the AEC circuitry algorithm and the DSP. So, so that portion of the audio feed to the far end can be nulled. So often when people hear the words acoustic echo cancellation, they believe it to be a panacea to correcting acoustic issues within the room itself. And that is not the case. It is strictly uh, an electronic phenomena uh, and is really has very little to do with the acoustics uh, in, the, in the near end, if you will. Uh, it does not fix all the ills of a poorly performing room acoustically. Uh, it does eliminate that feedback loop uh, from far end to near end and then back to far end again. Uh, again, uh, input gain is key to make sure that the AC is performing properly, that it has enough gain uh, to do the nulling um, along with uh, the noise reduction. And noise reduction determines what frequencies are constantly present and then it eliminates them from the signal. Uh, it's part of the processing that aids in minimizing, minimizing steady state background noise. Uh, errant sounds such as hand claps, door closures, sirens, uh, are not eliminated by noise reduction. Uh, it does aid in minimizing background noise such as HVAC, uh, but you only want to apply the amount of noise reduction needed to mitigate the background noise. Um, if you overprocess and go to a much higher setting than what is needed on the noise reduction, uh, it affects not only the noise, but the quality of the speech. Um, so it is important to deploy just enough noise reduction uh, in the signal chain to improve the background noise situation uh, while minimizing the effects uh, on the voice. Auto mixing, uh, often overlooked. Um, it's an important step in the processing the audio for intelligible conferencing. Uh, there are two types of auto mixing typically deployed, gain sharing and gated. Uh, we recommend the use of gated auto mixers uh, as gated auto mixers help increase intelligibility, clean up the ambient sound that would be otherwise picked up by open microphones uh, in a gain sharing mixer. Uh, the best auto gating mixers automatically adjust their gated threshold based on the noise levels in the room and certainly Shure's Intellimix uh, provides this feature in all of our uh, auto mixers. Um, it also can help our Intellimix algorithm reduces the comb filtering caused by the same source being picked up by multiple microphones, i.e. our auto mixers look at the signal and determine uh, which of those inputs have the higher uh, input gain and which is arriving earlier, and it will ignore uh, other adjacent channels uh, by the same talker. And certainly the number of open microphone adjustment is key in conferencing. Uh, I walk into a lot of systems where if there are eight microphones, the knob is set to eight. Uh, and if more than one person is speaking at a time, uh, it's noise on the far end uh, anyhow. So having a NOM of eight doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, I would recommend a NOM of somewhere between two and three, because again, anything more than two people speaking uh, is gonna end up just being uh, noise uh, on the far end. So as far as the system processing is concerned, we talked about gain, we talked about equalization, talked about uh, acoustic echo cancellation, noise reduction, and auto mixing. Uh, the Shure P300 audio conferencing processor uh, provides all of these uh, in a single box, and we we'll certainly encourage you to take a look at that uh, for your processing needs. Another step in the signal chain is the codec itself. Uh, and at least on the audio side, uh, there are a couple common codecs to look at here. Uh, standards G711, G722, and there are obvious differences between those two standards. Uh, one providing a much wider bandwidth uh, and uh, alterating the, the uh, original voice less than the other. Uh, and I, the point here is that the codec uh, is something that's, unless you're selecting the equipment, uh, is somewhat out of your reach in terms of how to improve it. But certainly, if you can select a codec uh, with a better sampling rate, uh, a better frequency response, 
the overall quality is going to be better. Uh, and this is true of VoIP as well. There, there, there are bits and pieces in the signal chain that are going to affect intelligibility that may be outside of your control. Uh, if it is within your control, then certainly make sure that you are selecting uh, the codec that's going to provide the least amount of processing and, and pass uh, the most amount uh, of the spoken word through to the far end. So we talked a lot about intelligibility and clarity, um, and certainly um, uh, we need some metric by which to substantiate this. And uh, speech intelligence uh, is a, it's a complex procedure. Uh, there have been a number of metrics used over the years to assign a value to intelligibility, uh, percent outcomes, clarity index, and, and certainly variations of uh, speech transmission and index or STI. Uh, STI in its various forms have become the, the most common form of measuring intelligibility. Uh, and there's a current standard uh, uh, speech transmission index public address, uh, which is a form of uh, STI uh, standardized procedure. Um, so STI has gained international acceptance. Uh, there's a, a number of organizations uh, that uh, prescribe to that as a standard. Um, and certainly uh, is probably at this point the easiest way to determine a metric uh, for the intelligibility of speech uh, between uh, two rooms, which is what we need to do for conferencing. So STI measures the speech transmission quality, which consists of several aspects. So the, the level of speech, the frequency response, uh, the background noise level, um, the presence of acoustical phenomena in the room and any uh, psychoacoustic effects uh, that may be taken into consideration uh, are measured. Um, and they're measured, okay, uh, they're measured. Um, it's a combination of, it's a source dependent measurement. So a specific stimulus signal has to be played through the system. Uh, in order to obtain a value. Uh, this is beneficial in a conference environment where you're, because your near end and your far end may be on different floors or they could be on different continents. So uh, the source dependent measurement actually works for you in this particular case. And, and typically what we would use is we would use a talk box and talk box is essentially an amplified loudspeaker mounted at head height. Uh, and this allows us to simulate the head height of speech and, and uh, it maintains the mouth to microphone variable, uh, that distance between the mouth and the microphone uh, in, in this particular measurement, which is important because we want to measure the entire um, signal chain. So uh, simulating someone actually speaking in the room uh, is the best way to determine the value. Now, what's a good value uh, for speech transmission index? So. Um, certainly, we have a little chart on the bottom, uh, on the bottom of the graph uh, slide here. Bad, poor, fair, good, excellent. <clears throat> For purposes of comparison, uh, a passing grade uh, in most uh, specifications is a 0.45. Um, I happen to know that 0.45 is a passing, 0.45 or higher is a passing grade uh, for the New York City subway system, which may not be a good example. But certainly when we're getting up in the 0.6, uh, we're demonstrating good intelligibility. Um, the passing grade is really up to uh, the end user. Um, what you're shooting for, can the system and the room that you've built uh, provide that level of intelligibility? But I would say that you have a very good chance of understanding what people are saying on the far end. Uh, if you are to the right side, uh, of the 0.45 value uh, ST, STI. Um, and it's relatively easy to measure this these days. There are apps uh, on your iPhone uh, that can provide this measurement for you and at least give you a good guide uh, as to where your intelligibility is uh, in your particular space. The perfect room, um, I'm not sure that there is such a thing. Um, there are often compromises that need to be made uh, based on space available, how the room will be used, the number of occupants, and of course, your budget. 
if we deploy what we just reviewed, it'll obviously go a long way at ensuring that we have deployed best practice in the design uh, and implementation of conference rooms. Uh, now this space, an anechoic room, uh, great for measurements, probably great for the far end, not so great for those people uh, who have to sit in it. Uh, um, the alternate to that, of course, is the Hannibal Lecter Suite, which is on three walls of glass, highly reflective surface, uh, not a great space either for conferencing. Uh, probably going to provide very poor intelligibility uh, to the far end uh, uh, in the conference. So the compromise is somewhere in between, right? Uh, we want to get as much absorptive treatment in the room uh, and still have it work out well for us. So certainly acoustical treatment where you can implement it, um, ceiling panels, carpeting. We want high isolation for adjoining spaces, mechanical equipment. Uh, lower your noise levels, uh, the HVAC. Uh, acoustical consultant, if you can bring them into the project, uh, would certainly be of benefit. Um, keeping the rooms that you're using for your conferencing as quiet as possible go a long way uh, in uh, ensuring that you're going to have uh, a, a good room, uh, certainly for exchanging uh, thoughts and concepts. So the use of technology, Suitable microphone, uh, microphone choices, place them appropriately. Um, make sure they're the, the correct one. Choose equipment that will provide the appropriate processing. Uh, adjust your system properly so it can provide the performance it's capable of providing. So in conclusion, we'll always be working in an imper imperfect environment, but the understanding and appropriate use of technology can tip the balance in our favor. But there are always some trade-offs uh, that will most likely to be made. And I think the founder of Sure said it best. Uh, we know very well that absolute perfection cannot be attained, uh, but we will never stop striving for it. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, there are a couple further references that you can look at. Uh, we have MXA 910 best practice, which not only speaks about the 910 itself, uh, but certainly talks a lot about the concepts in, a, in adjusting uh, the system so that it performs to the best of its ability. Uh, and then Shure Audio Institute has training online and the Shure Microflex Advanced Training uh, is available for you to uh, to take online. So that being said, uh, that's the end of the presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions, we're happy to take them at this time. Fantastic. Thanks for all that great information, Troy. Um, so yeah, it's time for questions. Please type them in. We don't have much right now, but we'll go through what we do have. Um, and if you do have any, type them in. Also, if you uh, think of a question later or a question about something completely different, um, you can always send that question to our application support team at support at shore.com. We've got a lot of smart guys and gals on that team, and they can answer just about any question about our products or audio setup or conference room setup. They're, they're a great bunch. So support at shore.com is also a great, um, great tool for questions. Um, so let's dive into it. Um, first question here is kind of uh, kind of let's kind of take everything that you just said and apply it in a specific sort of case so Troy if you wouldn't mind uh, just kind of quickly going down through what you would recommend if if we were doing something in that all glass room and somebody wanted to use audio conferencing um, what sort of setup tips and and microphone choices would you select for that that situation yeah well obviously absorptive treatment where you can get it in, in that particular space carpeting uh the, the front wall could certainly be treated the ceiling uh, could be treated i mean there are things like uh, acoustical plaster uh, that could be applied to the ceiling which will still give you that look of drywall uh, but it'll actually have some absorptive treatment beyond that microphone selection and placement are key um you want to try to minimize that distance between the talker and the microphone. Um, if I could put microphones, highly directional microphones on the table, uh, something like the MXA 310 in bi-directional mode uh, has a very tight pattern, um, I would look to do that. Uh, if I were precluded from putting anything on the table, which is very common with architects and designers, then I would look at ceiling mics. And the, in some occasions, uh, while that particular example would most certainly be covered by a single MXA 910. 
there is occasion sometimes to kind of go with a higher quantity of MXA910. Uh, and, you know, I equate the lobes from an MXA910 to like the beam of a flashlight. And obviously, if you hold it perpendicular, you have a circle. If you point it out a little bit, it turns into an ellipse. But obviously, the closer that ceiling mic is to the person who's talking, the smaller the diameter of that ellipse or that circle, right? So in some rooms that are really acoustically difficult um, and they don't want to put anything on the table, we'll, we'll, I might put two MX uh, A910s in that room. And I may not need all 16 lobes. I may only use four or five lobes from each. But because, because I'm moving that device closer to the, to the targets, I'm able to keep that lobe very tight on the people who are talking and minimize what I'm picking up from the reflective surfaces in the room. So again, if I could put table mics in there that were very directional, that would be great. If I were forced to go to the ceiling, uh, then I may start looking at, you know, using more devices and keeping those beams uh, a lot tighter. Great, great advice. All right, next questions. Do you, next question, do you have any suggestions for a speech transmission index tool? You know, there are several out there. I would I would look online. I, I kind of hesitate. Uh, I, I think if you do a search, um, uh, you can certainly find ones that are good and look at the ratings for them. Uh, you know, there are many that are uh, an app that you can buy in the, I think there's one out there in the, in the $50 range that's an app. Um, the stimulus signal is available as a download. It comes as a WAV file. So you can either play it back uh, from a computer or a, a tablet, uh, or you can, you know, put it on a CD if there's a CD in the room, play it through that uh, particular loudspeaker and take your measurement in the far end space. Then you'll have a very good indication of what your intelligibility is for that entire uh, signal chain. Um, but, you know, the apps start in the, in the $50 range. Uh, there's, there's hardware that's available that obviously is more expensive than that. Um, and then there are apps that cost a little bit more than that, but they also do a little bit more. So I, I'd invite you to, to figure out what your budget is uh, and then take a look at some of the options and, and do a search on some of the apps uh, and then see what makes most sense for you. Great. And so sort of the other side of that question then is, you know, what tool would you would be preferred to measure and determine the NC curve? Same thing again. Uh, there are apps out there that allow you to do it on your phone. Um, there is obviously a dedicated sound pressure level meter, uh, and you know if there, there's a pretty good difference between an app on the phone and a sound pressure level meter that you may pay upwards of five thousand dollars for, <laughs> and that usually has to do with a rating. Uh, there's a class one and a class two rating for a lot of this stuff. Um, I think for the most part, if you're doing casual uh, NC level measurements, if you're doing casual intelligibility measurements. Uh, any sort of assembly that's going to provide you a class two is close enough. Uh, if you're looking to go to court as an expert witness, uh, you might want to consider investing uh, in the class one measurement system. Uh, and again, if you look online, whether it uh, be the app or uh, for a particular measurement microphone, uh, they'll list their product as either being class one or class two compliant. Um, and you can determine which one is most appropriate for you based on your budget. Fantastic. All right. And it looks like we just have one more question. And it's actually a question for me. Surprise, surprise. Um, and that question is, will this presentation be available for download? Um, we do not actually offer the, the slides for download. However, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, um, we do record these webinars and they are archived and available for on-demand viewing. Um, and it usually takes us about one to two weeks um, to get those edited and, and distributed and published. So you can always go to shore.com slash training to see all of our past webinar archives. And as I said, this one will be there in about one to two weeks. Um, so that just about wraps it up for today. Um, if you do have a question that you weren't able to ask or something else that pops in, please send it to our friends at support at shore.com. Um, we want to thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you learned a lot. I know I sure did. And we hope to see you on the next one. Have a great day, everybody.